Good morning. I'm Jim Mintert, Director of the Purdue Center for Commercial Agriculture. And on behalf of the Center and Purdue Extension, I want to welcome you to our webinar this morning, the 2015 Crop Insurance Decisions. And of course, that's a decision that most of us are facing here in the next couple of weeks. So we're going to review some of the basic provisions and also look at some details, particularly with respect to a case farm. Um, before we get started, uh, if you want to email questions to us during the course of the webinar, we will be monitoring my email account uh, during the course of the webinar. You can email uh, to jmintert at purdue.edu, and we'll be checking those periodically during the course of our uh, webinar this morning and, and try and address those questions during the webinar. If we don't have a chance to address it during the webinar, we'll respond later today by way of email to you. Uh, your questions, of course, will be anonymous. We won't uh, reveal uh, the details, so don't hesitate to ask a question. So. Uh, joining me today is, is my colleague, uh, Dr. Michael Langemeyer. Uh, Dr. Langemeyer is the Associate Director of the Purdue Center for Commercial Agriculture and uh, kind of an expert, actually, on, on crop insurance. So we're glad that Michael is able to be with us uh, here today. Good so, morning. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, and I mentioned my email already, but let's look at the outline of our presentation. We're going to talk a little bit about crop revenue risk, uh, crop insurance products, uh, yield and revenue guarantees, and then we're going to walk through some examples that maybe will help make this uh, a little more clear. Um, let's start off with crop revenue risk. Crop revenue risk really results from price variability and yield variability, and we're going to talk a little bit about the relationships between price and yield. But I think that's an important, of course, it's been an important improvement in crop insurance uh, over the last uh, 15 or 20 years has been the movement to the revenue-based products to ensure something that we're, uh, as producers, a little more interested in, which is our our annual crop revenue, not just yield, which is where crop insurance started out. Let's take a look at annual deviations from trend yields. And this is for a particular county here in Indiana, White County, Indiana, not too far from the Purdue campus. And it looks at the percentage change in yields relative to the trend yield or trend adjusted yield on a year by year basis going back into the mid 1990s. The blue bars are for corn, the red bars are for soybeans. And as you look at it, uh, first of all, you, you see some, a couple of big changes there. I think in 2000, uh, looks like 2003, and then 2012, we remember pretty well, uh, when yields dropped be well below trend. And in 2012, notice how far below the trend the corn yields were. Soybean yields were not down nearly as much in White County, and that was true in much of Indiana in 2012. So you've got some, some significant variation there. Um, and also notice on the upside, we see some increases above the trend. Uh, we've had a number of years where trend yields, uh, or actual yields were maybe uh, between 5 and 10 percent above uh, trend yield. Interestingly, in this particular county in 2014, uh, yields were above the trend, but not dramatically above it. I think uh, corn yields that in 2014 up about 8 or 9 percent compared to the trend adjusted yield and soybeans up a little less than that. We had some counties in Indiana and throughout the Corn Belt where actual yields in 2014 were, were quite a bit higher uh, relative to the trend uh, than what I'm showing here for White County. I think, Michael, we had some yields in some counties in Indiana that were well above 25 percent above the trend and I think a few cases maybe above 30 percent. Yes. So uh, let's take a look at the relationship of harvest prices to the projected crop insurance prices that are used to compute crop insurance premiums. Uh, this slide again goes back to the mid-1990s. The blue bars are for corn, the green bars are for soybeans, and we've drawn in a black line there at the 0.8 level, so I'll, I'll reference that. So just to, for some clarity here, if you're at 1.0, that would imply that the uh, projected crop insurance price computed during the month of February would equal the harvest uh, time price, okay? So that would be a 1.0. In years when it's above that, it implies that the harvest price was above the projected price uh, determined back in February, and in years when the bars fall below 1.0, it implies then that prices in that particular year at harvest time were below the projected prices in, uh, com computed during February. So really a couple of things I think that kind of jump out at me when I look at this slide, Michael. I think the first thing is that uh, it kind of demonstrates the value of purchasing revenue insurance with what's known as the harvest price option. And if you look at the years when, when prices went up substantially, uh, what that means is that your revenue guarantee was effectively going up as prices went up, ostensibly because yields were going down uh, on a national basis. That's and the, the big one point. there is 2012. In fact, the, with, with 2012 for this county, revenue protection with the harvest price option was a fairly significant payment per acre 
if you picked the revenue protection with a harvest price exclusion, there would have been no payment. Uh, and, and so that, this clearly shows here that the revenue protection product in some of these years, 2012 was one of them, but also 2010, uh, 2002, 2003 for soybeans. There's several years where the revenue protection product was significantly uh, better protection. And that's especially true here in White County, but it's true really throughout most of the Corn Belt, yes. right? So that's one of the things you really want to think about. The other thing to think about is on the downside, and you can look at this on, uh, for example, in 13 and 14, um, those, the, 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 the black bar at, at 0.8 is if you're thinking about a decline in, in uh, uh, if you're buying 80% crop 80 insurance, coverage level. would you trigger a payment with average yields just because of the change in prices? And I'll say that again. So what we're looking at here is, is it, we drew the black bar in there at 0.8 to give you some feel for how often a change in price alone would trigger a crop insurance payment because of the change in prices holding yields at their average. And, and as you look at it, it, you can see by the relatively small number of times that the price bar drops below that black line, carrying 80% coverage, it's gonna be pretty rare that you're gonna trigger a payment because of the price decline alone, okay? So that's the kind of the second point to think about. So if you think about in, in a, a year like 2015, uh, and we'll show the numbers here a little bit later, but the odds of triggering a payment because of the price decline alone are, are probably fairly yeah. small. And what Jim's going to talk about here in the next slide or two is the fact that prices and yields tend to go in opposite directions. And so even though we see a, 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 a 13 or 14 below that 0.8 bar, meaning potentially triggering some payments based on a drop in price, if the yields increase is high enough, you still didn't drop revenue enough. Yeah, good point. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about that. When we talk about crop revenue risk, uh, in the Corn Belt especially, price and yield tend to move in opposite directions, meaning they're negatively correlated. Stated another way, when yields decline, prices tend to go up because supplies are relatively tight, and that creates that negative correlation. Um, that's often referred to as the natural hedge, meaning you have, to some sense, you're protected from revenue declines by the fact that when, price, when your yields go down, in your individual county and your individual farm, there's a tendency for price to help compensate by increasing. Um, and that effectively reduces revenue risk on, on most Corn Belt farms uh, uh, on a year-to-year -year basis for both corn and soybeans. And it does impact, it does impact the type of coverage level you would pick. Uh, when you're in the Corn Belt, because of this natural hedge, we tend to go towards very high coverage levels. I think this natural hedge plays into that. If you go to the Western Corn Belt, uh, conversely, uh, you usually have lower coverage levels because this natural hedge does not apply uh, as effectively out there. Yeah, and I, and I guess that's a good way to say it. It applies, but just not as effectively. Yes. Or stated another way, that negative correlation is not, not as, as high. strong. Yeah. So, um, so let's take a look at that. So we've got deviations in, in uh, corn prices and yields here in White County. Again, the blue bars are for corn. The green bars are for, uh, or, excuse me, the blue bars are for corn price. The green bars are for corn yield. And you can see as, as yields go down, on average, prices tend to go up. And conversely, as yields go up, prices tend to go down. So that's just really an illustration of that natural hedge. And you pointed this out earlier. If you look at 2012, uh, look at the dramatic drop in yield. I think in, in White County, we were running what looks like a little over 30% below uh, uh, on a year-to-year -year drop, and prices up over 30%. So uh, a pretty high. Uh, uh, pretty negative, strong yeah. negative correlation, uh, and we see that in some other years as well. So let's talk a little bit about crop insurance products, Michael. Yes, let's talk. First thing I want to talk a little bit about is the difference between basic units and enterprise units. It's very important uh, for, for premiums when you're looking at premiums. And so basic units, uh, all of one crop in a county for a specific share of production uh, is, is kind of combined, uh, and, and so that's kind of your basic unit. Uh, the, the enterprise, and you could have several farms that have different, the different basic units, and so uh, you, would, you would purchase those products separately depending on the farm. Enterprise units is the addition of all basic units in one county for a single crop. And so if you have several, uh, you have several FSA and RMA farms, uh, you can combine those into one bundle uh, and purchase the enterprise unit insurance. Why would you want to do that? Well, the disadvantage of enterprise units is you're less likely to get a payment. Uh, this could be a lower percent of the time you're going to get a payment with the enterprise units. Uh, why would you want to buy this? Uh, given that, uh, the, as we're going to show you here in a little bit, the premiums per acre are substantially lower 
if you if you uh, purchase the enterprise unit insurance over the basic unit. Uh, this is going to be a farm by farm decision. Uh, it just depends on how variable your farms really are. If you have some farms that are quite different than, than other farms, then you're probably going to lean towards the basic units. If you have some farms that have similar risk in terms of flooding, uh, uh, you know, what, you know, weather variability, those kinds of things, take a strong look at purchasing, purchasing your crop insurance as an enterprise unit because it's going to be much cheaper on a per acre basis. And, and one of the advantages of doing that, obviously, then that allows you to start thinking about increasing your coverage level. Yes. You might wind up holding your, yeah. your premium per acre yeah. more or less constant. Yes but have a much higher coverage level, which would be a much better Yeah, have a lot of trade-offs. We want to focus on trade-offs today because it's very important to think about trade-offs, and that's one of your trade-offs. If you're thinking about uh, thinking about cost per acre, very concerned about cost per acre for crop insurance, just like every other cost this year, one of the ways you could lower your premium is go from basic units to enterprise units. That is one of the things you could do. Uh, also, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, going from revenue protection to yield protection. I'm not recommending that necessarily, but we'll show you that the premium is quite a bit lower for yield protection. And so uh, one of the lessons we want to make sure we point out here is this is not the year to be dropping coverage levels. There's some other trade-offs you can think about rather than just dropping coverage levels to try to save money. Yeah, good point, Michael. And the yield protection products, you have the area yield uh, protection product, you have the yield protection product. The yield protection is a farm by farm case. Uh, you take your approved uh, APH approved yield Multiply by your coverage level, multiply by project, uh, projected price, and that gives you a yield protection guarantee. Uh, go through a slide here, a few slides down the road that'll actually calculate that for White County. You have your choices from 50 to 85 percent. The, the lower coverage levels really aren't worth very much for some, a county like White County that has pretty good yields. And so you're looking more at that 75, 80, and 85 percent, probably focusing more on the 80 and 85 percent uh, for the county that we're, gonna, uh, we're talking about today. Uh, the, the revenue protection policies, there's two different types. There's this revenue protection with harvest price exclusion. And then uh, on the next slide, there's revenue protection. Uh, this particular product is a little cheaper, the revenue protection with harvest price exclusion, but you don't get near the protection. Uh, and so for a year like 2012, uh, where harvest price was quite a bit higher than projected price, you had substantially better revenue guarantee with the revenue protection product than you did with the revenue protection with harvest price exclusion. In fact, it was so extreme in 2012 that for White County, on average, you would, not, you would have not received an indemnity payment if you had revenue protection with harvest price exclusion. So this is not a product I would necessarily encourage you to look at if you're trying to save premium costs. Uh, the protection's a lot less than the revenue protection product on the next screen. Um, so the revenue protection product, you have your area revenue protection, which based on county yields, and then you have revenue protection, which is the most common product uh, uh, sold in Indiana, uh, and, and I, I think also in Illinois and Ohio. Uh, it's a very common product across the Corn Belt. This insures against revenue loss due to an increase or decrease in price. Uh, it also insures against low yields. And so if you have a low price, low yield combination of the two, uh, which as we indicated earlier is relatively rare, they tend to move in different directions. But if you have some combination of, of lower price, low, or lower yield, uh, this, this uh, kicks in and, and gives you a, a, a revenue guarantee and, and, and gives you an indemnity payment. Uh, we'll show how this is calculated for White County, but let's just talk a little bit about it uh, before we get there. Uh, we take our, our APH approved yield or trend adjusted yield, whichever one's applicable. Uh, we multiply by our coverage level, multiply the greater of projected price or harvest price, uh, and those prices do vary quite a bit. We will show that. Uh, and so you multiply by the greater of those two, and so it gives you a pretty good revenue guarantee uh, with this product. Again, you have your choices from 50 to 85 percent. In Indiana, it's, very un it's not very common to, to purchase something below 75 percent, particularly for the county that we're talking about today. Uh, it's more common to look at 80 or 85 percent coverage levels. Michael, let's back up a little bit and talk about the area revenue yes. protection products. And, and one of the things you've got on the slide there says uh, coverage levels range from 70 to 90 percent. Sometimes people are tempted to pick one of those yes. lower coverage levels. Remember, you're insuring against a county-wide average, mm -hmm. and as a result, it's really important to carry those highest levels of coverage. Yes, yeah, just like we're talking 80 to 85 percent coverage levels for the revenue protection, I think you want to look at that 85 or 90 percent coverage level, maybe focusing on the 90 percent with the area revenue protection. Again, reason why, this is county yields, and so uh, it doesn't track your yields as well, and so, uh, and so go to that higher coverage level uh, for the area revenue protection 
Uh, there's also the, the protection levels. Uh, Jim, you want to talk a little bit about those? Because I think you actually purchased this product for a different county. <laughs> Well, yeah, so you have an opportunity, uh, and I guess the way I'll put that, yeah. Michael, is uh, when you, you should look at the area products on a county-by-county county basis because there's some differences, so I think that's really key. It's, it's hard for us to make a, an absolute generalization, even for the Corn Belt, so it's important to look at it using one of, the, one of the tools, and we'll talk more about a tool later. The second thing is you want to carry the highest possible coverage because of that county provision, and the, the product is structured that way, and you've got two options to do that. You really in my experience and in the situations I've looked at around the Corn Belt, it's important to carry the highest level of coverage because of that county aspect. And that's, that's a little bit of a switch, particularly if you've been looking at the revenue products uh, on an individual farm basis and are thinking about going back to the, to the area revenue. You gotta change your mindset a little bit yeah. because you're insuring a different thing. Yes, and, and the premiums can be quite a bit higher as you go to the higher coverage levels, but you're getting a lot more protection. That's what you have to, you have to keep in mind. And, and we're gonna talk about a, a, an IFR program evaluator where you can look at, at, at potential payouts, uh, probability of payouts, but also uh, net payouts. Uh, you know, simulated, of course, and so, you know, <laughs> Uh, so you always got to take those with a grain of salt sometimes, but, but uh, simul simulated uh, potential payouts, and, and quite often the, both of these particular products are, are fairly appealing uh, in the Corn Belt, both the area revenue protection product, which is a county based on the county yields, and the revenue protection based on, on farm yields. Okay, so let's look at some data, especially uh, not only the historical data, Michael, but uh, I think we've got some at least preliminary yes. estimates as to what prices are going to be used for the 2015 coverage. I want to look at a couple things here. First of all, I want to compare the projected price and the harvest price for 13 and 14, and then we'll move on uh, to looking at the, the projected price for 2015. And so let's look at corn for 2013 uh, projected and harvest price. Notice that the projected price was 565. We had that drop to 439, so a very large drop. Uh, uh, in, in, uh, in 2013. If you, if you purchase the revenue protection product, again, that protects you against a, a, a large uh, potential drop like that. Uh, soybeans did not drop in 2013. Soybeans followed a, a completely different set of supply and demand factors uh, in 13, and so, and so they did not drop uh, like corn did. In 2014, the same story again. We went from 462 projected price to 349 harvest price, and so again, a very substantial drop, and that's one of these things that the revenue protection is trying to help protect you against. Uh, soybeans also had a pretty large drop in, in 14, and so I did want to point that out, that there is years like, uh, like uh, 13 and 14 uh, for corn where your projected price is quite a bit higher than, than your harvest price. And again, that's why we purchase the revenue protection type products is it protects us against those uh, large price drops. Looking at 2015, uh, the, the, uh, the projected price is probably gonna be 415 to 420. We'll know later today or tomorrow what the projected price uh, is because it was based on the month of, of February uh, futures prices, is, but it's approximately 420. Uh, the last time I, I looked at some of the data, uh, soybeans approximately 995. And so the point here is, is your revenue guarantees are going to be substantially lower in 15 compared to 14 and 13, and particularly compared to 11 and 12, uh, which I'll show you a chart of that. And so the revenue guarantee is going down quite a bit, and that's one of the reasons why we wanted to do this webinar. Uh, what what how does that affect my crop insurance choices when you're seeing this projected price and potential harvest price quite a bit lower? Uh, one of the things it does is it, it really makes you think very hard about in, uh, keeping your coverage level the same or even increasing it uh, to kind of protect yourself a little bit more. Yeah, and so I think that's a key point, Michael, and one of the things we really want to stress. For a lot of Corn Belt farms, based on current prices and, and if we have something close to average or trend-adjusted yields, a lot of Corn Belt farms are going to find themselves in a, in a loss situation here in, in uh, 2015. And if you do have some kind of a catastrophic crop failure uh, uh, and wind up having a, a, a revenue shortfall and you fall back on your insurance, one of your challenges is to think about, well, what does my revenue guarantee, how does that compare with my cost of production? And one of the things we're suggesting is that you should probably take a look at boosting your coverage level to boost your revenue guarantee to bring that back in line or at least a little closer uh, to being in line with your production cost. And again, that's all about making sure that a year from now you're still in a relatively strong financial position and, and still well positioned to, to keep your farming operation moving forward in, in 2016 and beyond. So 
it's a little bit about actually thinking about buying crop insurance as insurance. Yes. I guess that's really the point we want to make here. All right. So let's take a look at some details here. Let's look at the, the yield and revenue protection guarantees. When you look at a lot of the crop insurance tools, like the fast tools at Illinois, for example, they show you the yield protection and revenue protection, but don't necessarily tell you how to calculate them. And so here's how you calculate the yield protection. This example is for White County. We probably should have labeled it that way, Jim, but this is for White County. The trend adjusted yield, uh, if you open up the, uh, the, the crop insurance spreadsheet, is 178, and so the yield guarantee is very easy to calculate. If you have 80% coverage level, you just take 178 times uh, 0.8, and it's 142.4. What that means is if yield drops below 142.4, uh, you're going to trigger a payment under the yield protection product. Again, in, uh, uh, in 2012, it dropped to a, below 110, and so there was definitely a payment uh, in 2012. Uh, there's not going to be that many years where it drops below this, but it does provide some protection in case you do have uh, uh, some uh, very uh, incremental weather uh, in 2015. The revenue protection, of course, protects both against a drop in price and a drop in yield. It's also fairly easy to calculate. Let's use our projected price of 420. We take our 178 trend adjusted yield times our 420 times 80 percent, and that gives us a revenue guarantee of approximately $600. Um, that's quite a bit lower than what it has been in the last few years, uh, but it's still, that's quite a bit above uh, a variable cost of production. Variable cost of production using the Purdue uh, crop, crop and Return Guide is $450 for rotation corn, and so we're still quite a bit above uh, variable cost in this particular situation, and we're covering you know, at least a portion of those, those overhead costs. So, Michael, thinking about last year, I think last year's price uh, on the previous slide was, what, 462? 462. Yeah, so you'd, you'd been looking at a revenue guarantee a little bit under $700 yes. an acre. So it's a pretty um, big drop. Pretty big drop in, in revenue guarantee, holding that coverage level mm -hmm. constant at 80%. One way to get a piece of that back is to think about the possibility of boosting coverage to the 85% yes. level. All right, let's walk through the White County let's, example Let's here. go through an example here. And, and through this example, I've, I've used 80% coverage level because that's one of the most common uh, coverage levels chosen uh, uh, in, in this part of the state. Uh, and so that's what I'm using in, the, in these slides. But I do have some slides that looks at uh, different coverage levels and premiums. And so those slides we want to spend quite a bit of time on because uh, that's where the real trade-off really comes in. Uh, when you're thinking about the different products. Uh, we do want to show this particular website because a lot of the uh, premiums that we're showing you, a lot of the simulated data that we're showing you, we basically derived uh, using this spreadsheet. There's a couple different uh, crop insurance spreadsheets. There's a crop insurance spreadsheet that, that focuses on premiums. Uh, my first few slides are using that spreadsheet. And then there's a spreadsheet called iFarm Program Evaluator that simulates what is the probability of getting a payment, um, you know, given giving a, a historical yields and prices? Uh, what is the probability of getting a payment? What is your, your net payment, if you will? What is your, what is your uh, uh, payment after you've uh, 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 your, your, after you looked at your indemnity payments minus your premiums? And so like, that's kind of a net payment. So it also helps you to do that. And the, and the real value of this tool is, is that, that tool is available for every county in the Corn Belt. And so plug in your county and, and see. Uh, see which one of these different products looks the best uh, for your particular situation. I know that's what uh, you've done uh, and, historically. And, and relatively easy to use. I guess we want to stress that. Yeah, these are, very these are pretty, easy. pretty user friendly. So yeah. don't be, uh, don't be uh, concerned about how difficult it might be to use the tool. Let's look at some details then. Let's look so at some output. We'll start with projected and harvest uh, U.S. corn prices. This shows you the difference and, and uh, we keep focusing on 12 because that was very important. Uh, you've got a lot more protection with the revenue protection product over the revenue protection with harvest price exclusion product because you can see the red bar was considerably above uh, the, the blue bar. So that means you had better protection with revenue protection. Let's look at 13 and 14 where the opposite was the case where projected price was above the harvest price. Uh, that's important to focus on because in years where that price, those two prices are quite a bit different, specifically harvest price quite a bit below projected price, those are years where you could potentially get a payment because of the drop in price. Now in those particular years we had an increase in yield uh, and so this, it, the, the drop wasn't big enough for a lot of farms in order to trigger a price. But nevertheless, uh, you can look at, so there's several different years here, 08, uh, we saw a, a, a big drop in, 
in price from projected to harvest price. And so that was a year we didn't trigger payment because the yields were pretty good, but uh, that was a year where price dropped quite a bit. And so that's what I'm trying to illustrate here, uh, in addition to illustrating uh, the value of, of having that harvest price option. That's particularly evident in 10 and 12, where you have that big increase in, in, uh, in from the harvest price to projected price. And you just get more protection uh, with the revenue protection uh, with harvest price option product. Stated another way, Michael, when you look back to 2012 and maybe to a lesser extent 2011 and even perhaps 2013, the crop insurance um, products were effectively giving you a, a put option on prices at a relatively attractive level. Yes. And that's not so much the case here in 15. That's really, and really wasn't as the case as much in 14 as well. So the last two yeah. years, including 15 as, as the last in the last two, you're really not getting that much um, within your price protection, perhaps, as, as you did for a couple of years there. And I think that has some implications about our marketing program. We can't rely on crop insurance so much for downside price risk protection. Definitely, yeah. Now, back up one slide, Jim. I wanted to show the 15 there. Uh, the projected harvest price is not going to be the same. Uh, it's highly likely it's not the same. Uh, we just use the same here uh, because we don't know what the harvest price is going to be. And so we've used 420 there uh, for both of those bars. Stated another way, we don't know if that red bar is going to be above or below, right? No. <laughs> okay, good point. Uh, if we look at the guarantees using the 80% coverage level, very common uh, coverage level here. Uh, here we're looking at the difference between revenue uh, revenue product with harvest price exclusion and the revenue product. And again, I, I've talked about this quite a bit. Uh, as you can tell, I like the revenue protection product over the revenue price with the harvest price exclusion product. Uh, and you can see again in 10 and 12, you had much more protection with the revenue protection product. Uh, 13 and 14, it didn't make any difference because the, the harvest price was lower uh, than the projected price, so the guarantee was the same. Let's look at those guarantees. Now we're looking at uh, revenue protection product, 75%, 80%, 85%. There's a couple things I want to do with this slide here, and uh, Jim, make sure you chime in here if I, if, I, if I don't elaborate on these points enough. But you notice here there's several years where the revenue guarantee was very, very strong. 2008, 2010, 2011, 2012, and 2013. In fact, in 11 and 12, I believe the revenue protection guarantee was above all cost of production. The point I want to make is that's very rare. That's a very unusual situation. And definitely not the case in, in 15. And, 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 and so don't think you're going to see that anytime soon. And when you look at 15, that's definitely not the case. Uh, here in, at 15, we're looking at covering variable cost of production. They're about $450 uh, using the Purdue uh, crop budget again. Uh, and so if you look at the 75% product in 15, uh, that's a protection of about $530. 80% about $565. And then the revenue protection at 85% is about $600. Uh, let's, let's, let's pause and focus on those amounts because those amounts make a big difference when we're looking at the trade-off uh, with premiums you know, with, between products. Uh, so going from 75% to 85% is a $70 increase in revenue guarantee. That's pretty large, Jim. It is, and we're, we'll take a look at the premiums here in a minute. But as you think about buying insurance as insurance, to protect yourself against the risk of a significant uh, loss in your operation um, and thinking about working with your, your lender, uh, it's, it's something we're encouraging you to spend some time thinking about, particularly if you've been carrying one of these lower levels, 75 or 80%, uh, think about bumping it up perhaps 5%, uh, whichever case you might be in. Another way to think about that, we've done quite a bit of webinars looking at uh, uh, possible net returns for 15, and we don't want to get too pessimistic here, uh, but our current budgets, or our current projection, projected budgets, I should say, are, are looking at a $100 per acre loss. You don't want to make that even worse by choosing a low coverage level, so you've added another $50 of losses to that $100. That's another way of saying that. Yeah, that's and right. so I think in this particular year, you've got to be very, very careful uh, in choosing your coverage level. This is probably the most important year we've seen in, 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 you know, since 2007 uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of being very careful in choosing your coverage level to really get some protection. I think the other thing we sometimes forget about, especially in the Corn Belt, is when you choose these higher coverage levels, your probability of collecting uh, against the insurance policy does increase pretty dramatically. Yes, it does. Um, it's relatively easy to trigger a 15% loss or so in the, in the Corn yeah. Belt. Um, it's more difficult to trigger a 25% loss. Yes. And so your probability of collecting uh, when you're on the 85% uh, policies does increase quite a bit. 
Um, and it's not that we would necessarily recommend 85% every year all the time, but I think this is a year this where... This is a year where you take a strong look at you, it. You really ought to take a look, particularly if you yeah. haven't been buying it in, in the recent past. Another point I want to make uh, before I get in too much into the weeds here and the premiums is we've talked a lot about the Farm Bill in and, and, and previous webinars, and, and, and I've indicated several times, but in case you weren't watching those previous webinars, um, I would make this crop insurance so choice separate from your farm bill choice. And so, uh, for instance, if you're going into the farm bill and you're looking at PLC and you're looking at, well, I'm getting this SCO coverage level, that's going to provide me some protection, just like crop insurance. Regardless of what you decide to do with the farm bill, uh, I, I, would, I would still think about going to fairly high coverage levels with crop insurance this year. Um, and let's just pause for a second. Just remember that the PLC program is a price yes. risk program, a price loss coverage program alone. It doesn't do anything with respect to yield. The ARC County program is a revenue-based program, but remember that it's capped out. It caps at 10% loss, right? And it's triggered when you hit, uh, uh, what, 85 or 86% uh, when revenue, county revenue falls uh, below 86% of the benchmark, and then you're maxed out at a 10% payment. Crop insurance obviously doesn't have that, that max feature, so you, you don't want to think that the farm bill uh, programs are going to replace your crop insurance coverage. Replace your crop insurance or worse, or, or just as bad, uh, make you reduce your coverage level because you have the farm bill. Because we got to remember the, uh, the, the ARC County and the PLC are triggered off a completely different set of prices than what we're talking about here. The way I think about this, correct me if this is incorrect, Jim, the way I think about this, farm bill is protecting you more against price variability over the five years of the farm bill. Crop insurance, remember, is protecting you against uh, price drop within the year. And so they're covering different things. They are, and they're computed differently, and, and uh, I guess we can't stress that enough. When yeah. we did the Farm Bill webinars and workshops around the state of Indiana, we made this point. I just, we just want to reiterate yeah. it. Don't, don't let your Farm Bill decision uh, get confused with your crop insurance decision. They are not replacements for one another and, and really ought to be considered pretty independently. So, so let's walk through the let's premiums. Let's look at 80% coverage level. Now, we could pick up premiums from the, uh, the Fast Tool spreadsheet at Illinois, looking at, pr at premiums for 85% coverage level or 75% coverage level, and premiums for other counties. One of the things I should point out, this is a really good corn county, and so the premiums are relatively low compared to some other counties in Indiana and other counties in the Corn Belt. And so you need to look at this uh, for the particular county that you're in. I mean, there are some counties where the differences, uh, differences between the products is quite a bit different. Uh, particularly as you increase the coverage level. Uh, but if we look at revenue protection uh, dash E, that's your revenue protection at the enterprise unit. Let's compare that to revenue protection basic units. That's the second bar, RP dash B, B. You can see there's quite a bit of difference there in premium. And so again, uh, you may want, if you, or if you haven't been using enterprise units, you may want to think about using enterprise units because there is, there is about a $6.50 difference in premium there. And over several hundred acres, that adds up pretty quickly. Uh, also, I want to point out with this particular slide is the difference between the revenue protection uh, enterprise uh, 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 unit uh, uh, insurance, so that's RP-E, and the yield protection enterprise, which is yp Dash E. Notice the difference in premium there. Uh, it's about five dollar difference. And so, with the yield protection product, you're 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 protecting yourself against that drop in yield. And so, if you think yield's the major risk that you're facing, may, maybe take a look at that yield protection uh, product uh, by itself rather than revenue protection. If you're really worried about both yields and prices, then of course you're going to need to look at the revenue protection product. Uh, and so, one of the trade-offs you can look at, and I'm not again, I'm not necessarily suggesting this, but this is something you could look at if you're really concerned about the premium rates in your county at the 85% coverage level, but you'd still like to have fairly, low, fairly high coverage level, maybe look at the yield protection product. And, and one reason we're bringing that up, and, and again, uh, I, think, I don't think either one of us are suggesting that this is a routine recommendation, but it's worth at least thinking about, is because at current price levels, the risk of triggering a crop insurance payment because of a decline in price Appears to us to it's be significant. Low. Yeah, it appears to us to be significantly lower than it was a couple of years ago. A couple of years ago, one of the reasons clearly to, to choose the uh, the revenue product as opposed to the yield product was the fact that you were getting a put option on corn and soybean prices with a pretty high yeah. strike price. The strike price, the equivalent strike price built into the current products, is quite a bit lower, and and so the risk 
uh, it appears to us, of, of triggering a payment because of decline in price. It's clearly not zero. I mean, that, yeah. we, we know prices could decline and it could contribute. Uh, but that's at least one reason to think Compar about it. Compa uh, particularly compared to 12, 13, and 14, if we'd have been sitting in the same room in spring of 2012, spring of 2013, spring of 2014, we wouldn't have been talking about the yield protection product uh, as much because there was, a large, like as you indicated, there's a larger chance of getting a drop in price uh, at, at those particular times than there probably is right now. Yeah. Um, and so take a look at, take a look at the, the premiums and, and, and your protection at the, uh, for, for these different products. Uh, you know, again, uh, you know, focusing perhaps on the enterprise unit uh, if that's something that fits your farm. Now, I, I guess I, when we talk about those price declines, let's just quantify that a yeah. little bit. A 20% decline in corn relative to our expected uh, February average that they're going to use is probably going to be about, what, an 80, 85 yeah, cent decline in prices. 80, 80 and I want to uh, maybe reiterate a point Michael made earlier, and that is the fact that, remember, these prices are not the same prices being used in the Farm Bill mm -hmm. programs. It would be hard to dr get that kind of a drop in price uh, using the, the marketing year average price that the farm bill is using, it would be easier yes. to get that kind of a drop in price yes. uh, for the harvest time, which is yes. what we're talking yeah, about October. here. So we're not, which gets back to the idea that we're really not necessarily encouraging you to step out and buy the yield-based product as opposed to the revenue-based product, but you could at least think about yes. it. Yes. Two years ago, we didn't even think yeah, you should think about yeah. it. This year, you could think about Food it. Food for thought. Okay. Uh, and, and, and also, remember that natural hedge, if price dr does drop to 340, do we think yields and yields for White County are going to be higher than lower? Well, my guess would be higher. In, in general, on average, yeah. over history, that would that be true. That may not be the case, but that, that would be my guess. And so there's a lot of trade-offs for you to think about here. We don't want to make this any more complicated than it needs to be, but I think this year uh, is, is one year where you, you really need to focus on costs and, and, and really focus on the type of crop insurance uh, policy that fits your farm. Uh, I really like this slide, and this is one of Jim's favorites, too. And what this shows you is that this is just using basic units. We could use enterprise units, of course, too. Uh, that information would be available in, in the Illinois spreadsheet. But let's focus on 75 80%, 85% protection levels. Let's look at the difference in premiums and then try to relate that to difference in revenue protection. So uh, at 75% level, we're, we're at about $10.30. Uh, we go to the 80%. Uh, and we go to $16, and so that's about a, that's about a $6 increase. Uh, remember, that's about a $35 increase in revenue protection. So that's, that's what, what you have to think about. Is that extra $6 worth that additional $35 uh, in revenue protection? Uh, let, now let's go from 70%, 75% to 85%. Uh, there you're looking at an increase of about $14, 14 or $15, and so more than doubling there. But remember, your revenue protection is increasing $70, uh, going from 75 to 85%. And, and the way to, way to think about that, uh, in addition to the $100 I may lose, can I afford to lose an additional $50 to $75? And so that's, that's one of the ways to think about that. And so uh, even though it's quite a bit higher uh, to go to that 80%, 85%, this year uh, is one of those years where you may want to consider uh, going to, to going to a higher coverage level. And the other thing to remember, Michael, is the fact that as you move around the Corn Belt, uh, particularly here in the Eastern Corn Belt, uh, the probability of triggering a payment under the 85 percent uh, insurance much coverage higher. is much, much higher. Yeah. And that's why the premiums jump as much as they do. In fact, if you use the I-Farm program uh, uh, evaluator, uh, it's more than double. The probability of getting a payment at 85 percent is more than double uh, the probability of getting a payment at 75 percent. And it makes sense. How many years, we showed that in the charts, there's not many years where you see a, a price decline of 25 percent, you know, going from, the, you know, you know going, going to the 75 percent product. There's more years where it's, it's 85%. So that, that's somewhat common. But think about yields, too. There's years where we have a drop in 15% yields, uh, uh, but we don't have a 25%. Right. It, it's, it's hard in, the, in much of the eastern Corn Belt to drive revenues below 75% of, of the revenue guarantee. Uh, one other point I want to make about that slide, Jimmy, if you could go back there, please. Uh, one of the reasons why the premiums increase so much going from 75 to 85 percent, maybe someone's out there saying, why in the world is the premiums increasing so much? It has to do with this probability of getting a payment. So that's certainly coming into play. You're much more likely to get a payment at 85 percent. But also, uh, the, the subsidies are slightly lower. 
True. Uh, as you go to the 80%, 85%, they're not quite as subsidized uh, as, the, as the lower coverage levels. And so that's another reason why uh, that, that premium is increasing. Now, again, we're showing White County here. There is some counties in Indiana where there's more than, <laughs> there's quite a bit more than a $15 difference between 75 and 85% uh, you know, uh, coverage levels. And so you do have to look at this uh, you know, farm by farm, county by county. Yeah, and that, that's a good point. We can't really stress that enough. That's why you need to use the tool because the numbers are going to shift. The pattern that we've got on the screen is going to stay the same, but the numbers are going to shift quite a bit as you move county to county and state to state. Yeah. And so uh, because the, the premiums are relatively low for White County, and so that means that the, there's not a, a real high probability of getting a payment for this county compared to some other uh, counties in the, in the Corn Belt and particularly counties in the Western Corn Belt. Uh, and so this is using historical payouts. And so what we're doing here is we're saying if we would have purchased 75% uh, revenue protection, 80% re revenue protection, or 85% revenue protection, what kind of payouts uh, uh, could we experience? And I'm getting this directly from, uh, from the, uh, the, the crop insurance spreadsheet uh, that Illinois uh, puts out. And you can see there, it, barely, we got a very small payment in 1998, less than $5. We got another small payment in 2013, less than five dollars for the 85 percent. Uh, those are the only years besides 2012 where we had any kind of payouts, and the payouts, really the only payouts of any uh, any size, uh, were 2012. If you take this back a ways, uh, it, uh, the, the, uh, we also would have got a payout in 88 uh, with very low yields in that particular year. But for this particular county, you don't expect to get payouts uh, very often. And this slide is, is clearly showing that. But, but those years where we did get a payout uh, in 2012, that, that provided some very good protection, uh, you know, helping us with the, uh, deal with those lower yields. So one of the reasons that's true in White County, Indiana, uh, Michael, is the fact that the natural hedge in this county works pretty well. So this is a county where when yields drop, they tend to drop nationally and drive prices higher. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's going on in this county is uh, the soils are good enough that we tend not to have large drops in yields uh, that would, uh, would mm -hmm. trigger. So th those are the, really the, the driving factors in this county. So again, your county might not fit that scenario, so you need to think about uh, using the tool and looking at the situation in your county. There's another tool we've talked about. The, the, what, the, the previous slide was really based on, on, the, on the crop insurance uh, premium uh, spreadsheet uh, that Illinois has. There's another tool called the iFarm Crop Insurance Payment Evaluator. Uh, you can find it on that, on that uh, uh, link that we showed earlier. And what this does is it simulates. Uh, based on your particular county, it simulates what the probability of, of getting a payment or the frequency of payment, and, but it also simulates the estimated net average cost of insurance. Let's be, make very sure that people understand what estimated net average cost of insurance means. Uh, that means that we take, we subtract our indemnity payments from our possible payouts. And a negative number means we actually uh, received more money in indemnity payments than we paid in premiums. And so you actually want a negative number uh, when you're looking at this uh, payment evaluator. And, and so I've just got a few products highlighted here. It actually looks at the area products too, and I encourage you to, you to take a look at that. But let's go through some of the numbers here. Uh, average yield, 178. That's the trend adjusted yield for, for White County. This is White County again. Uh, this, uh, it's indicating that there's a 10% of the years with yields below 151. Uh, remember the trigger was 142 there, so there's, I think there was about a 15% chance of yields being below 142, uh, the, uh, the yield guarantee for White County. And so there is some probability of yields dropping below that, uh, and it is protecting you in that, those particular cases if you have a yield protection uh, 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 product. Uh, yield protection product at 80% coverage level, uh, frequency of payment is about 10% of the time. Uh, revenue protection at 80% coverage level, uh, frequency is about 20%. Uh, if you go to the 85% uh, uh, the coverage level, I don't have it on this particular screen, but Jim and I were talking about it earlier, that frequency of payment goes up to 28%. And so a pretty big difference there, Jim, uh, between the revenue protection at the 80% coverage level and at the 85% coverage level. and so. Uh, as your coverage level goes up, the chance of getting a payment is higher, but of course your cost of the insurance is higher. Uh, the estimated net average cost of the insurance, uh, yield protection at 80%, uh, we're looking at a, 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 net, a net gain there, if you will, uh, of $1.65. Uh, at the 80% coverage level, we're looking at a net gain there of three fifty. dollars So the net gains aren't very big, but that's not really why you buy crop insurance. You're buying crop insurance to protect you against these very low yields. Uh, very low yields or very low prices. And you can see, even for White County there, there's some pretty healthy percentage uh, 
uh, percentage chances there uh, where you're going to get a payout at 80% coverage level. And that's what you're trying to protect. You, at the, with, uh, with the yield protection, you're trying to protect yourself uh, in those 10% of the time uh, where you, your yield is going to be low and the revenue protection at 20% of the time where the yield and or price are low. Truthfully, if you're looking at a county like White County, if, if, so if your county resembles some of the charts that uh, we presented previously with respect to uh, yield losses and, and the relationship to changes in yield and prices, you'd probably want to look very closely at the 85% yes. coverage level. That yeah. probably would be even more, well, yeah. it would be more attractive yeah. than the 80% yeah. level. You're going to spend more money, uh, but over a period of years, the odds of that working out well for yeah. you are pretty good. And I guess the other point, we keep stressing this, but I think it's an important one, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hammer it again one more time. We've done some previous webinars where we talked quite a bit about preserving working capital. One of the big reasons we're encouraging people to think about some higher coverage levels is a way of protecting your operations working capital and making sure that in January of 16 that your farm still has a strong working capital position. That's really what we're talking about when we say buy insurance for insurance. Yes, and that's why we were trying to focus on the difference in revenue guarantees between the different products because you know that that seventy dollars may not sound like that much but come next fall that could be make a world of difference in terms of preserving working capital. That's exactly right. So uh, we want to make one final point. This is really a farm bill uh, point but I guess at the end of last week uh, the USDA's uh, Farm Service Agency came out and indicated that they did extend the deadline with respect to updating yields and reallocating bases. So the second column on that uh, uh, timeline with respect to the Farm Bill has been updated. Previously, you were supposed to have completed that by last Friday. They've now pushed that back and it's, it's the same deadline as the decision to uh, make your election choice between ARC and uh, uh, the PLC program. So we've got a few more weeks if you uh, uh, need to update yields or reallocate base acreage uh, with respect to the farm program. And we wanted to make that point because we know a lot of people uh, watching this webinar might be in that that position. So with that, Michael, I think we've got at least one or two questions here. Let's see if I can uh, pull those up real quick on the email. Um, so we have a, a, a viewer that, that wrote, wrote in and said, uh, are all companies uh, figuring losses the same way? And so I think he's looking at uh, uh, whether or not an adjuster um, from different companies, or representing different companies, might might view losses somewhat differently. And uh, I'll let you kick it off, and then maybe I'll, I'll chime the indemnity, in. First of all, the indemnity payments are calculated the same way. I do have a couple publications on our website, uh, for the Center for Commercial Agriculture. Uh, look under resources. There's a, there's a spot there for crop insurance. I do have a couple publications there. One of the publications goes through how to calculate the revenue guarantee and how to calculate the indemnity payments. And so the indemnity payments are always uh, calculated the same. I, I don't know uh, how the, you know, about the yield adjusting. I wouldn't think that would vary that much. So I, I will make a comment there. I guess I've had a little bit of experience there. Um, it, there is some variability with respect to the fact that you've got an individual coming out and, and making a yield determination. Now, now all the adjusters, as I understand it, should be following the same yeah. guidelines. So there's no difference in guidelines, but there is the human factor. And I guess I'd, have, I'd compare that to a referee at a basketball game. Two different referees might look at the same play a little bit differently. Two different crop insurance adjusters might look at the same field a little differently. However, there is an, a, a procedure you can go through. If you're not satisfied with the initial adjuster's uh, appraisal of the crop, you can go through the appeal process. You've got some opportunities there. So if you feel you're not being treated fairly by an individual adjuster, there is an appeal process uh, and you can work through your crop insurance agent to, uh, to get a second appraisal, for example. So uh, as far as I know, every company will do that. So there is a process to try and make it as fair as possible. Uh, but there is a human factor, right? So there, but they do follow the same guidelines. Um, I think the other questions this listener had, or the viewer had, were probably addressed in the slides that we that we have already gone through with respect to the calculations and and how payments would occur. So, um, I think that probably wraps it up for today. So, if you have some additional questions about crop insurance, don't hesitate to uh, to contact us. Uh, we'd be happy to try and respond to those uh, those questions. Uh, Hopefully you found today's uh, webinar pretty helpful. This uh, webinar will be available as a recorded version, and if you registered for the webinar on our online system, you will receive an email as soon as that's available, and it'll probably be uh, sometime tomorrow when it's posted on, uh, on YouTube, so you have a chance to view this again. Um, and then the second thing we'd mention is the, 
Uh, we do have uh, some information on our website with respect to crop insurance. And the, the last point is uh, we really encourage you to, to do some analysis on your own farm uh, using the, the farm, uh, farm doc tools that we've referenced here during the course of the website. That's what we use. We find them very helpful, very easy to use, very accurate. Uh, they've been doing that for a number of years, and it's a, it, those are good tools. And so we'll have links to out there as, to that information as well. Uh, and, and, and when you look at the tools, there's two things you want to do. Uh, you, you can look at the historical pay payments. So what would the payments been uh, if we'd have had years similar uh, to, to, uh, to what, what, what has been 96 on? That's where that you, uh, we had a chart related to that. That's where I got that information is from the, the, uh, the crop insurance uh, premium uh, spreadsheet. And then the simulated tool, the iFarm program evaluator, sim gives you simulation. Uh, so that's more based on futuristic look. Uh, you know, what the probability of, of payouts. And so I would look at it both, you know, both from a simulated standpoint, using the evaluator tool, and also from the, from the spreadsheet, premium spreadsheet, uh, looking at historical payouts. And so I guess maybe to wrap it up, Michael, one of the take-home messages from our webinar today, I suppose, is the fact that a lot of us have gotten in the, the mode of doing the same thing with respect to crop insurance we did last year. And we're suggesting, uh, particularly if you've been carrying one of these lower levels of coverage, for example, here in the Corn Belt, maybe 75% on a, on a revenue-based product, this is a year when you ought to think about making a change relative to what you did last year. And, and you ought, we ought to think about whether or not you want to shift over and perhaps carry one of those higher coverage levels. Yes, think about the higher coverage level. Also think about that trade-off between the premiums for basic and enterprise units. Take a, look at, take a look at that. And then this year, as we indicated in the webinar, take a look at the yield protection product and compare that to the revenue protection product. And, uh, and so look at, look at these various trade-offs this year because you want to be cost conscious, but you also want to make sure you've got a lot of protection. That's right. Well, with that, I think we're going to wrap it up for today's webinar. Thanks again for joining us on our Crop Insurance Decisions uh, webinar for 2015. And on behalf of uh, my colleague, Dr. Michael Langemeyer, and uh, the Purdue Center for Commercial Agriculture and Purdue Extension, thanks for joining us, and we wish you a good day.